have with us Dave Davis, President and Chief Legal Officer for the Utah Retail Merchants Association, Michael Mitchell from Director of Government Relations with Public Supermarkets Incorporated, and myself, I'm Andy Allen, President and General Counsel of the North Carolina Retail Merchants Association. Uh, when Laurie asked us to do this panel, the purpose behind it was we, Dave and I, do work both for grocery industry and, and the retail industry. We both are, uh, us in 2005, and Dave for a while, his organization uh, had a merger of the food industry. And so we, we are fortunate enough to do a number of issues for grocery, but a number of you guys may not do the grocery store specific. However, what we have started to see, and I think Mike can attest to this, and a number of you can as well, there's been a blending of the retail industry. And so you see companies, Walmart, Target, CVS, Walgreens, those companies are now full-fledged into grocery, as is companies like Dollar General and Family Dollar, and they sell those items as well. Throw in Kmart and Sears, and you're seeing, like I said, a, a very much having similar issues on food, and we'll get to them, alcohol issues, that are now key issues for some of your key members. And so what our goal today was, was to talk about some of those issues just to make you aware of them, as well as heighten the importance to some of your members that you, on issues that you may not have thought they were originally. Uh, with that, we're gonna start uh, not from the hospitality suite perspective from you last night, but start out with Mike Mitchell talking about some alcohol issues <laughs> of key importance. Uh, I think that's why Sean's here front row with us this morning. So with that, I'll turn, I'll turn it over to Mike. Great, thanks Andy. Um, from a public's perspective, we're, we feel very fortunate, if I, if I can just backtrack one, uh, to build off one thing that you said, that in our five states that we're located in, we've got great dynamics from a Florida and a South Carolina model where Florida and South Carolina handle both the retail side and the grocery side, and they do excellent, excellent work on our behalf. But then in Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee, uh, we've got two strong associations that we get to deal with. Uh, and for the most part, they work very well together. So that we are grateful for the working relationships we have in those five states. But from an alcohol perspective, in 2013, outside of Florida, our number one legislative issue is going to be wine and grocery stores in Tennessee. And we have been working for a number of years with Jaron Springer with the Tennessee Grocers. And just a few weeks ago, we were over in Nashville. Uh, Lindsey Napier and I were over in Nashville. And we sat with Roland and we sat with Jaron and we really are asking the Retail Association to get heavily involved and invested in this issue because this is we're going to take an all-hands-on-deck approach on this issue. For all of you who are not aware, in Tennessee, um, we can sell beer in our grocery stores, but we can't sell wine. Um, it's a little crazy. And then on the flip side, if, if you look at the package stores, uh, the package stores can sell alcohol, they can sell wine, but they can't sell was it napkins? They can't sell corkscrews, they can't sell ice. Um, I was with the speaker back in June and she said, well, would you have a problem if package stores were allowed to sell napkins and paper plates? I said, no, of course not. I said, you know, bring it on. I said, you know, I, I think our volume discount would be a little bit better than theirs. Um, but that's, that's a, um, a major issue and it's, it's kind of leading into my next issue, Sunday sales. We had Sunday sales two legislative sessions ago in Georgia, and we were fortunate enough to get that passed. That was, you know, I'm gonna defer to Tony and Brian Hudson on that. I think it was like a nine year fight in the Georgia Capitol that we were working on this issue. Um, and it's one of those issues, much like the wine and grocery stores, where inside the Capitol, it gets so intense and everyone's so focused on it. But if you go two blocks outside of the Capitol and you talk to a constituent or you talk to a, you know, a person who's working nine to five on, in a regular business, they don't care. They think it's a ridiculous issue. Why is there so much political capital? Why is there so much focus? Most importantly, why is there so much time in the state capitol being worked on on this issue? And what we were able to do in Georgia two sessions ago um, was really just pry. We just needed some momentum, and we were able to pry this issue loose. I say we. I, you know, I had a very bit part. You know, our folks on the ground um, were able to pry this issue loose, and once once it was able to start gaining momentum, you couldn't stop it. And I think that's gonna be the same situation we're gonna face in Tennessee with the, um, with the wine and grocery stores. So uh, thanks, Mike. Just a, a, a quick pitch to, to add on to what Andy has said. Uh, more and more on the retail side, we see our members getting involved in food issues. And Mike referenced Roland and Jaron in Tennessee and what a great working relationship that there is between 
the retail side and the food side. And I understand that it's not necessarily realistic in every instance to bring those two sides and merge them together. But uh, what a great example of the two sides working together. So my encouragement to all the state executives would be form those relationships and make that a good working relationship between the food side and the retail side. I think that it benefits members on both sides of the business to do that. So one of the items that was... It, can I just say one thing? From a member perspective, you have no idea how much we appreciate a relationship like uh, the retail and the grocers have in Tennessee. It makes, it makes our lives incredibly easy, and, and we are grateful for that. I, I tell you every time I see you, Roland. So. Sorry. Um, so Alka Pops, um, and those are typically flavored malt beverages have been an issue. And I, I don't know that I'm in a great position to talk to anyone about, you know, great alcohol laws being from Utah. We have some of the most <laughs> quirky alcohol laws. Um, we were joking at dinner the other night, you know, at midnight, the, the, the bars come down and there's beeping sounds and everyone's cut off and, and things like that. Uh, we did have an issue that came up with Alka Pops where they were taken out of the grocery stores and placed into the package agencies and the state uh, controlled uh, liquor stores. And it is an issue uh, for members. Uh, the crux of the issue was these are in essence gateway drugs to other things. They're typically very sweet in nature. Um, uh, they mask the uh, alcohol taste uh, in them, and so there was a real push to do that. And I think that it's an issue that you have to keep your eye on uh, in your respective states. Obviously, us more so than, than others, but there are many out there that may have this issue that, that pop up to try to drag those away from the grocery store channel and into the more restricted um, package agency and alcohol uh, or liquor store model. So just wanted to put that on your radar as, uh, as an item that may be, uh, may be out there, may pop up for you. And then I'm going to pop in for a minute. Same, same, uh, very similarly, and I know a number you've dealt with this, the Four loco issue, the caffeinated alcoholic beverages. Uh, four, four loco, you know, the, it was the quantity of, or the alcohol content of four beers with caffeine. Uh, which, you know, nationwide there were some people that died and, and, and it really set off a firestorm. And I know they've repackaged and reformulated the product, but I, the regulators are still not happy, the attorney generals are still not happy with it, and so you're probably going to see that pop up again. The other issue I want to, another issue I want to mention, I saw Sally Jefferson here, and we had this fight in North Carolina, and, and both in wine and beer, and you'll start to see it very soon in, in your states, because when InBev, uh, purchased Anheuser-Busch, they really started putting a lot of pressure on the wholesalers, uh, and they started doing differential pricing to the wholesalers in various states. Miller Coors, once they merged, you, if you had a Miller wholesaler in a district or a franchise area and a Coors in the same franchise area, they started trying to force those guys to merge by giving one better price than the other price. And so you will see franchise, franchise or laws coming to your state. And we had the same thing on wine. Um, with the wine wholesalers, and they tried, you know, their their argument from the wholesaler perspective was Constellation and Gallo were trying to force uh, mergers between the wholesalers, uh, the ones that did the different brands, and they were being treated unfairly by the by the wine manufacturers, and so or the wineries, especially the majors out of California. And so you'll see legislation. We 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 were one of the test cases in North Carolina with it a couple of years ago. And what they argue a lot of times is it shouldn't apply to the, the retail uh, tier should not be involved in this because it only really applies between the wholesale tier and the manufacturer tier. But I will tell you, it is really a knockdown drag out and the wholesalers are sort of arguing they're small business, this is what keeps them in business. Uh, you know, they have a monopoly, a license to print money basically with what they have. It's the only product you can't wholesale in your grocery store. I mean, you can wholesale uh, pharmaceuticals, tobacco, firearms if you want, but you can't do alcohol. And so they really, as the middleman, really, you know, they've ingrained themselves in the community, but it, it is a huge, huge fight that, that is going on and will probably go on throughout the country. I know Sally, like I said, is here with the Wine Institute, can probably comment at some point in time. But your Anheuser-Busch folks that represent them, the Miller lobbyists, 
you know, at their national meetings right now, they're getting the same piece. This is the major battlefield going on throughout the country. Um, the other issue on the alcohol side, and we've done, been pretty successful with it in North Carolina, um, and we're working on it in South Carolina, that's, in, that's being used in major retailers, is uh, wine tastings and beer tastings, uh, you know, to allow customers to sample products in their stores. And uh, a number of our grocery stores have actually built built-in wine displays where, in the wine section, they can do those do those tastings. It's funny the wine the wine and beer wholesalers don't really like it, even though you're selling more of their product because they feel that they've got to provide some labor for it. Uh, but you're starting to see this, especially in some of some of the stores. I know the Walmarts and, and Sam's Clubs and folks like that do these tastings as well. Very successful. They sell a ton of wine doing it. And it's just amazing with the wholesalers don't want to do it. And they push back as much as the Christian coalition does at some point in time. So that's another issue that, that, that you may be seeing. I know, I know a lot of retailers are getting more and more interested in, in that, that sort of process in their stores. Hey, Andy, can I say one thing yep. about the caffeinated beverages? By the way, I did see Chris House perk up a little bit when you said wine tasting. Yes. That'll be later. <laughs> I'm just excited to see you got a clean shirt today. Yeah. <laughs> but and this is more of a plea to the members that are that are out there. Sometimes merchandising can be an issue as well with some of these uh, caffeinated and uh, alcoholic beverages when they get merchandised right next to the non-alcoholic beverages and you walk a member through a store or they get into a store and they say look here's the problem uh, there isn't a clear distinction between what is alcoholic and what isn't alcoholic and when you hold the products together I know we as retailers don't have a lot of uh, uh, control over that and they look almost identical to one another those are the things that drive <coughs> the state action, uh, you know, people to, to go out there and to regulate those types of things. So from a merchandising perspective, as retailers, all, if we can do a good job of delineating, look, here's your alcoholic beverages, here's your non-alcoholic beverages, that's always helpful in sort of thwarting back these attempts to claw them out of the stores. So Dave, would you say it's a problem when you get a call from the Commissioner of Agriculture's office and they want to know why ping pong balls are being sold in the beer aisle? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the true story. Uh. <laughs> okay. With that, we'll move on. We're going to move quickly into another area that's not necessarily as much legislative, although there is a, a, a piece of that, but is more, probably more regulatory, and that's SNAP or food stamps. And right now in the United States, you have 46 million Americans on food stamps, 15% of your population. What that drives in some stores, especially in rural areas, is maybe 25 to 50% of their sales on the food side is in food stamp benefits, and which is a very sad commentary, I think, on our country that we have that many people in, in need of, and hopefully that will start to turn some. But the problem that you had on that with, with SNAP was, from a lot of states, they only distribute the benefits on the first, first day of the month for the whole entire state, or the first four days of the month, and then some the first 10 days of the month. And what you saw grocery store-wise, as well as companies like Walmart and, and Dollar General and some of the other ones who have a tremendous amount of business in that business, is you saw people that would come to the store at 11.59, do all their shopping so that when it turned 12.01 on their day, they could check out. What the other thing that drove was the first 10 days of the month, companies saw a lot of business and they had a lot of man hours, but the last 20 days of the month, they didn't have any. And they couldn't schedule their wholesalers to deliver their products to them. Companies like Walmart had a hard time distributing their product out of their warehouse, knowing when to distribute it to the store. Customers got very little selection of fresh fruit and that sort of thing the remainder of the month. Um, People that, uh, stores that had people full time at the beginning of the month had them at part time for the rest of the month because there was nothing for them to do. And so what you've seen recently is, is states, and mostly driven by retailers, it's a very big deal to them, trying to stagger out the dates on when those people receive benefits. In North Carolina we did it uh, last year and we moved it from the first 10 days and now we've staggered it out to the first 21 days so that it's more evenly spread throughout the month and it helps us again wholesale wise employee wise 
and it's better for the consumer. Uh, South Carolina, they're, we're getting ready to, Lisa that's with us, we worked on down there with the department, they're getting ready to stagger it out. Every new person that comes onto the plan will be moved to the, towards the end of the month, and if you fall off the plan, which often happens, you'll be starting to move out a little bit. I know Tennessee just recently is, is changing it, effective this year. Uh, Georgia is, is changing effective October. Um, you get pushback from the consumer advocates that are worried about people having to stagger their benefits out a couple of days. But again, it, it is a very, very important, um, important piece for the retailers. Again, if you think about stores that have 25 to 45 percent of their, their revenue is coming off of those, off of those recipients. Um, that is a, a very solid revenue number that comes in every month. The other thing that we're seeing, this is maybe more legislative, and I know we saw it in Florida and in nine or ten other states, and this is a, an interest of some of Kevin Fisk's uh, members, is you see um, states trying to restrict what can be covered by SNAP. And it's soft drinks or, you know, can you buy, you know, certain kinds of cereal, can you buy candy, what can you buy with uh, your SNAP benefits, and that's going to be an issue too, because you know you want to stay within the federal guidelines. You want customers to be able to get what they what they can get without differentiating between uh, various products. But that's a very important issue for you. I know it's a big deal for companies like Dollar General, Family Dollar, Walmart, Target, anybody that's that, that's doing that's selling any kind of food. The SNAP benefit piece is one of the problems we ran into in Florida. Um, during this past session was with limiting what folks could purchase is we we had two very difficult bill sponsors one on the house side and one on the senate side and it was one of those issues where we'd go in and we'd say we want to talk to them and and they said well no you know this is wrong i sat behind you know she the senator kept referencing how she stood behind somebody at a publix and bought and saw them buying a birthday cake or a wedding cake with their snap benefits um and she just we kept trying to explain, look, you know, you have to get an exemption. There's no, an exemption has never been granted. Uh, in order for you to be able to track what items were banned, you'd have to get weekly U, uh, UPC code updates and, you know, who was going to manage that. She didn't want to hear any of that. The House sponsor pretty much was the same way. And every time I saw him, he'd just say, well, why are you trying to kill my bill? Why are you trying to kill my bill? And I, of course, punted to the Florida Retail Federation and said, well, they're the ones doing all the work. Uh, but the, but, the, um, but they, um, it, it, that, that was one of the things that was so frustrating. And even uh, colleagues of theirs would come up to them and say, look, what you're doing is not a good, it's not a good idea. It sounds great in theory, but in practice, it's not a very good um, it's not a very good piece of legislation, and ultimately, if you don't compromise, we're going to kill your bill. And, all, and they refuse to compromise. So, thankfully, these legislators were able to kill their bill. But that's that's one of the things we're we're running into, where people are, are looking at this issue and they're taking a very pure approach in in the big picture. But when you get whittled down to the details, you know that the it, it doesn't it's not a great piece of legislation. So, that was some, that was the challenge we ran into. Um, the Senate sponsor is not going to be in the legislature next year. The House sponsor may lose. Um, he's, he's going to have a very tough race. So we don't know if we're going to be facing this issue next year um, again or not. But if, if so, you know, hopefully we'll have some friends in the legislature who will be able to, you know, either find some type of sensible compromise or, um, or stop the legislation. Let me talk just a little bit about electronic food benefits in, in general. We're all trend or going in that direction because of a federal mandate. We do have sort of a unique program that's being rolled out in Utah. I believe it's uh, first in the country and that is uh, J.P. Morgan Chase um, has partnered with our Department of Workforce Services and they're producing what is this super card. It's a super benefits card and it will have the, uh, it appears at this point, it will have the Visa logo on this uh, supercard. Um, it will house a whole host of benefits from SNAP, TANF, uh, unemployment insurance benefits, uh, state payroll, if people are, if we have unbanked uh, uh, employees, they can have their payroll put onto this card. And it, so it's a multi-purse card, uh, supposed to be quite smart in nature. 
clearly from a retailer's perspective, one of the issues is, is any time that you place that Visa uh, logo on there, the issue of interchange raises its, uh, raises its head. And exactly how are we going to deal with that? Now the farm bill right now, the federal farm bill dictates that SNAP benefits in particular must run interchange free. And so we have sort of these two networks, and I probably ought to get John Malaben up here to talk about this because he could probably give more cogent thoughts than I can, but here I go. Um, <laughs> so you've got these two networks, uh, one being a commercial network where interchange is charged, and then you have the Quest network where uh, uh, transactions can be routed and they run interchange free. SNAP benefits, because they must run interchange free, have to run over that Quest network. The question now and the push and pull, I think, between the retailers and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is what's going to happen with these other sets of benefits that are on there? Are they going to be forced to be run over the commercial rails and be subject to interchange? Or is there some opportunity to actually if you do a good job of routing, take these transactions and run them over the Quest network and avoid paying interchange uh, on, on those transactions. So this is a development that we have in Utah. We continue to uh, uh, sort of fight the battle. I know that many of our majors uh, that are very deeply involved in, in food, like Target and Walmart and Kroger, um, they are very much engaged in this, uh, in this discussion. The fact of the matter is, this is a issue that is coming to your state. It will be, I think it's an overall strategy by um, the large banks and the credit card companies because they want, they see this benefit space as a new space to play in that they historically have not been in. 